Good day YouTube and welcome back to the Troopers Workshop. Today I'm going to be showing you how the Trooper is building an easy 3D magnetic RPG playing field system. The system I came up with isn't entirely unique in of itself, but a combination of a few great ideas that were provided by some other gaming terrain builders, namely Professor Dungeoncraft over at Dungeoncraft University, Joseph at Broken Terrain, and Black Magic Craft, links below. In order to save some time, I'm going to dive right into the finished product and overall design of the system, and you can probably figure it out from there. But if you want to see how the donuts were actually made, you can keep watching the rest of the video. So, without further delay, let's roll that beautiful bean footage. So... I wanted to keep my terrain system somewhat simple, lightweight, quick to set up, expandable, and then easy to pack up and put away at the end of the game. I also wanted to be able to quickly change the terrain features with little effort so as not to slow the game down, and I wanted to have pieces that wouldn't get knocked over or moved out of position during gameplay. I also didn't want to have a system where both tiles and terrain features had magnets, as this would require me to be constantly planning and tracking the polarity of each of the hundreds of magnets within the system. I also didn't want to bother with sandwiching a piece of metal in between two pieces of foam to give the magnets something to attract to. I tried a couple of practice pieces using that method uh, and it was just kind of a giant pain in the rear. I just found it to be impractical, uh, hence this hybrid system where we are essentially embedding small metal nuts into the gaming tiles themselves. And I'll be sure to give credit where credit is due on this one. This idea was inspired entirely by Joseph over at the Broken Terrain channel. Let's take a closer look uh, at the gaming tiles. So each 2x2 two two tile has two zinc nuts glued into the edges of the foam on opposing sides from each other. And then two neodymium magnets glued into the other opposing edges. This allows the tiles to be magnetically attracted to each other without planning out the polarity of the magnets on the facing edges. A simple orientation of the tile right or left guarantees magnet to nut attraction to the adjacent tiles. We can see here the surface of the tile has numerous zinc nuts glued in at every other junction of the grid spaces. This gives our magnets something to attract to, but again, eliminates the need for keeping track of and planning out the polarity of the magnets being used in the game pieces. And then finally shown here is a wall section with the neodymium magnets embedded in them along the bottom edge, allowing us to quickly place our walls and corner pieces anywhere on the grid system in virtually any configuration that we want. One of the incredibly helpful ideas that I picked up from Professor Dungeon Craft that I would like to illustrate here is, it isn't always necessary to erect every single wall in order to make a room. Sometimes just placing corner pieces to outline the overall dimensions or size is more than adequate to get the point across and makes everything from setup to moving your figures around far easier. It also means maybe we don't have to spend as much time or resources building a giant stack of wall sections for our gaming layout when a dozen or so different lengths will do. 
Here I'd also like to point out that I only made the walls and corner pieces two inches high. This was done intentionally as the height is more than adequate enough to get the idea across, yet allows us to make more walls with less foam and gives us the ability to move figures or other interior features around in the playing area with little difficulty when compared to full height wall sections. To start off the dungeon tile system, I'm using a 12 by 12 by half inch thick piece of XPS foam. I've been buying these off of Amazon. Uh, they're pre-cut, so it makes uh, that part really easy for us. I don't have to buy a giant sheet of the foam uh, from the hardware store. And it also just happens to be the perfect size playing field for an RPG. I'm grabbing my ruler and I'm now marking off one inch marks on all sides of the tile so we're going to have one by one uh, playing spaces which you know can equal five feet ten feet or whatever you want when you're playing now that i have those reference lines drawn on the foam I'm coming back through with my ruler and a box knife and now i'm actually lining those marks up and i'm starting to cut um, the uh, grid reference lines uh, that we'll use as our playing field into the foam. So I'm just going and really lightly cutting. All I'm, all I'm wanting to do is just kind of cut that outermost membrane of the foam so when I come back through with a ballpoint pen and draw in kind of deeper and wider lines, uh, my pen won't tear up the foam. So remember, just cut real light. We don't want to cut too deep into the foam because uh, then that will kind of weaken the whole piece. And although I didn't film myself actually drawing in the, the grid lines, I did uh, film this part. So right now, in each little inside each little playing tile, I am drawing in little individual tiles. And although the step isn't entirely necessary, it helps to kind of break up the monotony of the playing field, and it makes the piece look more visually interesting, especially when we start doing paint wash and dry brushing and it kind of gives us that classic um, dungeon tile look so with all those tiles drawn in now I'm going to take a ball of aluminum foil and I'm going to roll it back and forth side to side I'm going to press it kind of deeply into the foam so that the rough texture of the aluminum ball will transfer um, that texture over to our tiles and kind of give it a, a rough hewn um, kind of uh, look to it make it help look a little bit older and again uh, to make it a little bit more visually striking and interesting With the tiles drawn in and texture done, it's time to start gluing the zinc nuts into our playing surface. You'll note there are already holes drilled into the foam, which this is just merely the result of me forgetting to video that segment. Uh, and I figured that rather than go back and video it, you could probably figure out on your own. So let's just keep going. With that said, I'm now just going through, I'm adding a dollop of PVA glue inside of uh, each hole and then pressing a nut down into it. Now it's time to move on to start building some of our wall sections. My walls are going to be two inches tall. Um, that way you get the sense uh, that it is indeed a wall, but also too it's low enough to where your players can reach over the wall easily and uh, move their characters around um, on the uh, on the battle tiles uh, without worrying about knocking them over, and they can still kind of see what's going on. So, anyways, uh, I'm just going to be taking some of the scrap foam that I have sitting around, and like I said, cutting those wall pieces uh, about two inches high and they're going to be varying lengths i'm going to have three inch wall sections four inch wall sections six inch wall sections and then i'm also going to be building uh, some corner pieces as well
With my wall sections all cut out, I'm going to bring them over to the table where my Dremel drill is. I'm going to drill out holes that correspond with the nuts um, that are placed on our playing field. And now we're going to start gluing in our magnets. Um, I don't really pay attention to the polarity of the magnets at this point, which is why we're we're placing the nuts on the uh, floor tiles because it doesn't matter which polarity will be facing outwards it's still going to be attracted to the nuts so just dab up a little bit of extra glue there wipe off the excess and I'll let these sit for a couple of hours uh, before I go on to the next process So it doesn't really matter what order you're doing these steps in, uh, but generally I glue the magnets in uh, and then I start this process. So just like with drawing the tiles on the uh, dungeon floors, now we're going to start drawing patterns onto our walls. And so I'm just kind of drawing a random brick pattern of uh, different sized uh, bricks to make up these walls. And just like when we were cutting the patterns in the foam previously, I start light with my first pass and I go a little deeper on the second, I go a little deeper on the third. Uh, be sure to round those corners so these kind of look like those classic rounded stone walls and press deep enough so when we get to the painting stage we're not going to obscure uh, or lose a lot of that uh, detail that we went ahead and scratched in. Um, and it doesn't really matter if they all line up. In fact, it's actually better if they don't line up. It uh, looks a little bit more realistic, like someone just gathered a bunch of stones and mortared them together uh, to make our wall pieces. With the pattern drawn out on those wall segments, now I bet you can guess what we're going to do next, and that is give it the old aluminum foil ball treatment. I'm paying close attention to uh, the corners of that. I'm rounding that out so it looks like kind of worn and weathered stone. Now, as I'm getting ready to move on to the uh, priming and painting phase, I start thinking to myself, I'd like to have some kind of jig that I could hold these pieces with uh, and so I wouldn't get Mod Podge and paint all over my hands. So I took some popsicle sticks and I'm gluing uh, those nuts to the bottom of one of them. And those are lined out so they will match up with the magnets uh, in the wall and corner pieces. And then I'm going to take here in a second uh, another popsicle stick and I'm going to glue it at a 90 degree angle. So I'm kind of making a T. Uh, that way, uh, my, uh, my little painting clamps have something to hold on to uh, while these are drying and I'm moving on to other pieces. And as you can see, the finished product actually works pretty darn good. I'm able to pretty much coat that entire wall with my Mod Podge or my paint uh, or, or even when I get to the point where I'm adding varnish uh, without getting it all over my hands. And then I can put that directly in my uh, drying clamps to dry and then move on to the next piece. And there it is right there. Just like everyone else uh, on YouTube who's been building uh, similar tiles out of foam, uh, I am now going to kind of protect the foam and prime it with a mixture of Mod Podge and some kind of paint. Uh, so I'm just using a dark pewter gray uh, you can use black, you can use light gray. Um, I, I, tried, I tried several different ways of priming uh, the styrofoam. I tried this method, uh, I tried airbrushing with a primer, and then I tried a, a rattle can primer. Um, so, disclaimer, a lot of the rattle can primers will actually melt your foam, so be incredibly careful which one you're using. Um, and uh, so then I tried I tried an airbrush primer and then like I said and then I tried this Mod Podge with paint uh, I gotta be honest I like the Mod Podge and paint uh, method the most uh, now I do thin my down quite a bit I don't know the exact ratio I'm probably doing 
um, you know, maybe a 50-50 or 60-40 or mix. Uh, but I didn't want it to go on so thick that it's filling in all, all the cracks and all the detail that we worked so hard um, to get in. Uh, so I ended up doing um, kind of two thin coats um, to both satisfy the requirements of it being both a primer uh, and kind of protecting the foam, but also too while not uh, covering up all the details uh, that we put into it. So real quick, I filmed this kind of supplemental segment um, that kind of ties in with the previous video. Uh, when I first started doing the tiles, I was just individually batch mixing however much Mod Podge and paint that I needed, and this became really time consuming. So I just decided I was going to make some bigger batches. So I have some of these 8 ounce plastic squeeze bottles that I got off of Amazon that I like to put paint and whatnot in. So I just dedicated one of these to this mixture. Um, it makes it really easy because uh, you mix it up uh, and you just squeeze the, the Mod Podge mixture right onto the tile, work it in with a paintbrush, uh, and uh, bickety bam, you're done. Uh, I don't know the exact ratio. I was filling uh, the bottle up about halfway with Mod Podge and then probably about another third of the way up or about another 25-30% of paint uh, and then finishing it off uh, with some water. And I was looking for a consistency that was maybe a little bit thinner than uh, acrylic house paint. All right, now I didn't film myself actually painting the set pieces um, after <clears throat> after the Mod Podge was dried because I just used the same basic pewter gray uh, apple barrel color, and I didn't think I really needed to film that. You all know how to put down a base coat. Um, but something different I'm trying this time is uh, with the wash. I'm not doing an oil wash, and I'm not doing an acrylic wash. Um, I, uh, I've seen several people use inks to great effect. I've never done it before, so I thought this would be a great opportunity to try inks out. Um, so I took uh, a, both a mixture of brown, like a dark brown, and a black ink and uh, mixed them together again I'm not sure the ratio it was mostly it, it was probably about 60 40 or maybe 50 50 I, I just did it till I liked the color um, but I also added a little bit of flow improver and then uh, a whole lot of water until I got uh, you know that wash consistency uh, that we like to see when we're uh, when we're doing our pieces like that um, so overall I gotta say I am I am totally sold on using inks as uh, washes for big pieces like this. I'm not a giant fan of it on figures yet, um, but uh, as you can see, here's a freshly applied uh, wash coat right here, um, and it, it looks pretty good already, and it looked even better when I started dry brushing. And speaking of the dry brushing, um, that's the phase that we're on now. Obviously, once the uh, once the wash is set um, and uh, nice and dry, then I'm going to get out all my dry brushing colors. And again, I'm just using um, the kind of cheap Walmart Apple Barrel colors. Uh, I have some different shades of gray. Uh, I have a dark chocolate brown, um, and I also have a couple of tans. Um, so don't feel like you're stuck just using grays. That ends up creating like a really kind of monochromatic piece, uh, and it's not going to be as visually interesting. So feel free. I, I even had a couple of tiles where I mixed in some greens and oranges, and it looked amazing. Um, so don't be afraid to experiment with some, some different colors. You know what? If you mess it up, it is super easy um, to just cover that back up and, and try something else. So as you can see, I'm also using um, my, uh, my uh, heat gun uh, to kind of uh, hurry the process up. Because remember, if we try to dry brush um, colors on top of colors before they've had a chance to set, then you don't have layers of colors. What you end up doing is you just kind of mix them all together into this like weird monochromatic 
um, mess and it just ends up looking like garbage so if you don't have a heat gun uh, I tell you what they're pretty cheap over at the big box hardware store um, and they they are invaluable when you're working on projects like this uh, and uh, time is of the essence and I'm not really going to show you a lot of detail on dry brushing y'all probably know how to do that if you don't um, then you know you can find another YouTube video that does a much better job explaining it uh, than I would have here but as you can see, a lot of those colors are starting to really lighten up those tiles and it's starting to make that wash process pop. And I really love the way that these uh, turned out, especially with that texture um, and, the, uh, and the tile that we drew in uh, there earlier uh, in the video. Now, as I was getting done uh, with the dry brushing process, I kind of noted um, that I lost some of the detail um, in the uh, cracks between the tiles and whatnot. So I went back in um, and I put some wash in a little cup and then I thinned it down even further. So it didn't really um, change the color of the tiles whatsoever, but it just kind of um, made that detail pop. It went back into those cracks, kind of darkened everything up, increased the contrast, and uh, man, after I did that, I tell you what, uh, the whole thing just looked amazing. So don't be afraid to go back in and reapply a wash um, to kind of make your details pop back out again. And as I mentioned uh, at the uh, beginning of the video, um, on one side uh, of the uh, playing field is going to be the classic um, dungeon tiles and then on the other side I was going to do um, kind of a woodland pattern so when we had um, combat scenarios happening you know outside in the woods or in the grasslands or whatnot I could just flip the tiles over and use that and not have to make more tiles um, so I'm just using um, some different shades of green um, green Vallejo paint that I've got sitting on my desk and I'm just airbrushing out random patterns um, to kind of make it look like a woodland scene and I'm not going to go into great detail about this because I just kind of did it on the fly and I didn't really have much of a plan I just did it until I thought it looked right and then went on to the next tile um, I'm also at some point I'm probably going to make um, some kind of white ones um, for uh, for some snow combat uh, and then probably a few desert terrain ones also and then later on in the future uh, I'm probably going to make some hills and mountains out of some stacked styrofoam um, so if you're having uh, combat and like some 3d terrain outside you can put some stuff together but I think that'll be a later video or maybe I just won't make a video about that because you could probably figure it out on your own it's not that hard <laughs> Now in of nearly 2,400 soldiers. During the construction phase here, I uh, <clears throat> was doing a test fitting of the walls, and I noticed that if I wanted to put wall sections together, they don't quite meet up the way 
that they should. So if I push this down, it'll still stand up, but it's not it's not sticking to the nuts. So I got a couple of different choices. One of them is add more nuts in all these intersections, which I said I didn't want to do at the beginning because I did a test piece uh, and it ended up looking really awful. So next best thing is I'm going to add more magnets in between the existing ones on all the wall pieces. So that will allow me to move a wall section down and meet up end to end and still be able to hit those nuts and be pretty solid and not knock over. So that's going to be the easiest fix is just add a few magnets on those wall sections there. So we'll finish this off with a couple of flyby shots of the finished product. Uh, the very last step in the entire process was uh, applying a varnish. And I didn't film that uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but if you're curious, uh, for this project I used a, a Winsor & Newton matte varnish uh, to uh, protect the paint, kind of dull everything down a little bit. Did two medium coats and I gave it uh, a couple of uh, weeks to dry. Well, that pretty much wraps it up. Overall, I am incredibly pleased with the way this project turned out, and I can't wait to use it in D&D campaigns that I'm running right now. You may have noticed a few terrain items in the flyby shot at the end of the video that I didn't show being made here, but I probably will cover those in a later episode. So be sure to stay tuned in for that. Thanks so much for stopping by. I hope you found the content to be useful. And if you did, maybe think about giving us a like and subscribing to the channel so you don't miss any future videos. In the meantime, I hope you're rolling plenty of 20s. This is Trooper134, signing off.